Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 15, Episode 46. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for joining us back on this Friday show. Steelers Station of the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to enjoy their bye week sitting pretty atop the AFC North at 6-2. and two. They remain in first place regardless of what happens this weekend. Hopefully everyone had a great Halloween, Dave. Did you get a costume on? You go some trick or treating yesterday? No, no. Turned the lights out and had a nice quiet night. Uh, you know, just uh, trying not to. You know, when you have a dog in the house, you don't want the doorbell ringing all the time <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, uh, I think it's been. I think I'd let you guys know in the chat. It's been. I think the last time we dressed actually dressed up for Halloween. Uh, I will, me and my wife went as Wayne and Garth. So that's, uh, that's how long it's been Wayne's world, nice. uh, uh, kind of stuff there. But I understand you gave out like what 50 bags of candy or something like that. Is that what you told us? Yeah. They cleaned me out. They had a bunch of neighborhood kids and within like an hour I was basically tapped out. So a lot of fun. I like Halloween. I like handing out candy. Kids have a, just go nuts for it. So that was fun. All right, and you mentioned the Steelers top of the AFC North are now as of uh, Thursday night uh, pending the rest of the action in the AFC. They are now currently the number two seed in the AFC behind the Kansas City uh, Chiefs uh, thanks to the Houston Texans losing to the New York Jets on Thursday night football. And, uh, boy, what a catch by Garrett Wilson uh, in that game. That It was an ugly game to sit sit and watch uh, through through most of it there, but uh, a couple of good catches uh, by Garrett Wilson and the Jets ended up pulling that out to move to, what are they now, three and six at this point. Mm-hmm. Houston is six and three. Houston dropped down to the number four seed. Obviously, a lot of big games in the AFC this, uh, this weekend. I think Buffalo plays Miami. Uh, Denver and Baltimore, I think, face off. Uh, those are the number five and number six seeds uh, there. So uh, it's good. It'll be good to sit back and just uh, be a spectator uh, this week uh, when it comes to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And when obviously when they get uh, back from the bye week, they'll start preparing for the Washington Commanders, who I believe play the New York football Giants uh, this week. And for those wondering, and it appears George Pickens himself is wondering the difference between why was Garrett Wilson's catch a catch? Why was George Pickens catch a no catch is that it has nothing to do with Wilson getting his right foot down twice. It was his shin that landed in bounds. And I feel like we need a visual aid for this podcast, Dave, where it's, you know, both feet is a touchdown, one foot twice, no touchdown, one shin equals both feet equals touchdown. So that's a difference there. Pickens taking to Instagram in and out deleted Instagram story, wondering why that was called a catch. A bunch of Steelers fans in my mentions wondering the same. That is the difference. Nothing to do with Wilson's feet. It had to do with that shin getting in bounds. And yeah, that was a maybe catch of the year. Same shin as the same foot too, right? Same shin as in same foot? Uh, the foot that Garrett Wilson got down, he got the same shin down on, right? Was it the right shin? I didn't even look at what shin it was, but uh, I think you're right. I think uh, you're right. Yeah, I believe so. so well, I'm a, a sports center showing it like four every, every 40 <laughs> seconds, so I've got it on right now. Let's see. Uh, left foot, left shin. Okay, it was his left foot. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so left yeah, foot, same foot, shin. same shin. Yeah, so, but either way. So, uh, uh, the same foot hitting twice is, is uh, does not equal this, uh, the same foot, same shin. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No, so, no, anyway. no wonder he's upset, but, uh, yeah. uh, anyway, that was a hell of a damn catch and I'd be interested to see if that's brought up to the rules committee and whatnot during the off season. But, uh, anyway, uh, it, it, it obviously was not a touchdown for the Steelers and, uh, you know, obviously they went on to win the game, but, uh, been nice to see him score right, right from the get go there, but we got a lot of other stuff to talk about then, uh, 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 
one foot, one shin. <laughs> Shins and feet. That is the, the headline of the podcast. Yeah, uh, just a programming note. There was no Wednesday show, as Dave mentioned. And people, some people wondering, but uh, as Dave said on the show, I uh, decided to just wait until Friday to really comb through the All-22 and the team being on the bye week. A little less to discuss, but a couple of roster moves here, Dave, to keep us busy. Pittsburgh making several moves since we last spoke on Tuesday. They have waived outside linebacker Ade Ogundeji from the active roster. They released two from the practice squad in LaMichael Pirine, the running back, and Thomas Graham Jr., the training camp standout corner. They ended up re-signing Aaron Champlin to the practice squad, who was waived on Monday before the Giants game. They ended up re-signing Ogundeji to the practice squad as well. And the most interesting and notable move of all is the team had activated uh, Dylan Cook from injured reserve on, I believe that was Wednesday, and then 24 hours later waived him from the active roster. Cook had a foot injury he suffered in the summer, missed the first, obviously up until Wednesday, had his practice window open a couple of weeks back, was practicing in full, gets activated ahead of the 21-day deadline, and then turned around and waived 24 hours later. We'll see if he goes back to the practice squad. They do have one spot open, but that to me is a curious decision. Yeah, because you had to, you know, for for starters, you had to burn uh, designated to return uh, uh, move to get that done. Uh, second thing is I kept waiting for the official NFL sheet uh, from the league to update yesterday, and I checked this morning to it. Never did. I wanted to just double check, make sure there was, you know, maybe some sort of injury settlement or something crazy that that maybe flew under the radar, but I uh, have not been able to. Con- it doesn't sound like that was the case, but I mean, can't roll it out to you actually see it uh on 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 the sheet there but uh we'll now wait to see uh, heck maybe it'll happen during the uh during the podcast today i don't know but uh whether or not he circles back to the uh to the practice squad there and also the the team uh or the league reinstated cameron sutton did you hit that one Oh, yeah. I apologize. I was looking at the transaction sheet on the Steelers site, and, and it's not listed there, but you're right. Officially reinstated Cam Sutton since uh, week nine has begun, and Pittsburgh has been granted a roster exemption through Monday, November 4th. So as of right now, technically, Sutton does not count against the 53, though, of course, for him to play, and really after that exemption expires Monday, he'll have to get added officially to the 53-man roster. And then that will make 52, and that still leaves them would leave them one spot open, correct? Yes, and I imagine that will go to Tyler Medikevich, who should get activated off of IR, I would assume, before the Commanders game. Right, so we'll have to see what other kind of uh, you know minor roster manipulation happens, either with the practice squad for the rest of this weekend or for the 53-man roster starting on on Monday. But uh, as you mentioned, Cameron Sutton's uh, roster exemption should expire, so that would be one of the moves. And uh, we'll have to see if they just carry a 52-man roster up until, let's say, Saturday uh, to, uh, to, to do something with Tyler Matikiewicz. Now, I know we're just guessing, but why do you think Cook was waived? We had the expectation of, okay, Cook was going to come back, and he looked like some promising depth. His camp this year probably was not as quality, as strong as I expected after I thought really impressing in 2023, his first summer with the team, and really coming on strong to come out of nowhere to some people's minds and, and make the 53 and be rostered the entire season. We thought, okay, you add Cook, maybe you release Calvin Anderson, the backup tackle who gave up that sack on third and goal in the Giants game, but Cook ends up getting the heath ho instead. Any idea why they made that move? None. And once again, interested to see if there's any kind of injury stuff related to that. Maybe, you know, maybe. We got activated on Wednesday. You got hurt. In yeah. 24 hours? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I definitely do not know. It was a curious move on their part because you would think he, you know, at least from what we've seen out of uh, Calvin Anderson so far that, that cook was the more and, you know, established guy, the better, better of the two there. Uh, obviously haven't seen Calvin Anderson play a lot of snaps uh, uh, overall there, but yeah, it, it, it's just a curious, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe, Maybe they thought the train had left them behind, but you know it's easier for the offensive lineman, obviously, to get back on that train than anybody else. But it, it's curious. Uh, I mean, we'll we'll if if they don't sign him back to the practice squad, then that really makes you curious there, mm-hmm. right? Uh, yeah. Now they were. It's not like they were going to carry that extra 
uh, offensive linemen. They were only going to carry nine probably on the 53, but you would have thought that if once he got, once he got moved back to the, uh, off of IR to the 53, that, you know, the a reciprocal there, uh, at some point before the next game would have been, you know, Calvin Anderson. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a clue other than maybe they just view Calvin Anderson as the better player right now. Yeah. That may be the simplest explanation of all, just like the way that Anderson has practiced. And as you said, being available and working with a team more than cook maybe plays a factor as well, but with tackle depth being a bit thin with Dan Moore being a free agent after the season with cook being young, potentially somebody that could battle for a swing spot. I don't know. Maybe he goes practice squad and maybe this is all just kind of a bit more moot, but we will see. It definitely surprised me. And even, even Thomas Graham getting released. He had a really good summer. He was versatile. There weren't a ton of slot corners. I mean, Sutton coming back, maybe it's the reason why they felt that Graham was expendable. He appeared in one game this year against I think, the Colts and had a couple of gunner snaps. So uh, he was a guy that really stood out in training camp, was durable, available, had a bunch of picks, got talked up pretty good by Terrell Austin, didn't have a whole lot of slot options there when guys like Raylan Arnold got injured. Obviously, he had Beanie Bishop, but Graham was a guy that you know really turned some heads this summer. So Maybe he circles back at some point, but but that was surprising there. Um, with Ogan Deji getting waived, I imagine that's a good sign for Herbig to come back for week number 10. And with Pirine getting uh, released from the practice squad, then I imagine that's a good sign for Cordero Patterson, uh, his health for week 10. Then, of course, you had Champlin of the practice squad to round out the running back room. We'll see what happens with Jonathan Ward. Does he keep his practice or his 53 uh, man roster spot? Is his helmet on game day with four running backs? We'll see. But that's one thing to watch for exiting the bye week. Yeah, uh, you know, look, hopefully coming out of this bye week, this team gets healthier with Frazier and, and Herbig, and we mentioned Matikavich coming back. So, uh, you know, no, as I always like to say, there's no no bad time for a bye week, and especially when it sits right here in the middle of the season, especially with all the injuries that this uh, team uh, has gone through, and, you know, all teams go through this kind of stuff. But uh, it is a great time to get healthy, especially with all these AFC North games uh, coming up. Uh, it would be great to, I mean, Herbig would was absolutely on fire before he went down. Frazier was obviously uh, playing uh, playing very well. And yeah, just be good to get these bodies back. So, you know, between now and obviously next uh, Saturday, I'm going to see some a little bit of roster manipulation and see which uh, 48 they ultimately dress when it comes time to take the take on the commanders. Yeah, overall, Pittsburgh in a really good place health-wise, exiting that Giants game seemingly healthy overall. And then, like you said, getting everyone they could get back for this Commanders game in Frazier and Patterson and Herbig uh, beyond. So sitting pretty in a lot of ways for the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. All right, Dave, during the bye week, you know, things are pretty calm. There's no Mike Tomlin press conference. Don't hear really from the players. But what you do hear from are the positional coaches. Really, only only time they speak in a season is during the bye week when they're made available to the media to check in. And so uh, I don't know if any coach, offense, defense, special team said anything too notable. Uh, I thought Pat Meyer had an interesting comment on Broderick Jones. Still was optimistic about him, but just said he's kind of got to focus, got to lock in. And that kind of speaks to maybe where his head is at right now. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just you know, obviously when you look at what happens with has happened with Dylan Cook and all. And as we kind of talked the other day uh, that, that, you know, based on things Mike Tomlin has said as well, too, they're just going to let Broderick Jones try to work through this. And uh, Brod, uh, didn't Pat Meyer say something about, you know, he's all. He, you know, his age and the amount of games that he's played and, you know, they're, they're just going to let him feel his way through this overall, it feels like, and, uh, try to, try to, you know, keep, uh, they all look, uh, even Duke, right. Uh, had some, who's, who's really, you say anything about, uh, any offensive lineman on Twitter. And you, usually you, if, 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 if it gets back to Duke, Duke will try to fight you on almost any of them. But uh, even he had some kind of discouraging words about Broderick Jones uh, and, you know, how it kind of looks like he's, you know, uninterested, I guess, in so many words uh, uh, on some plays there. So uh, we still got half of the season left here and uh, plenty of time and, and easy for Broderick Jones to kind of top several of the performances that he's had so far and they're going to they're going to need him to as well because uh, he has been a liability over there at that right tackle spot 
Yeah, like it or not, he's your starting right tackle, especially now that Cook has been waived. I mean, he is going to be your guy, and you just have to try to make him work. And, you know, talking about interest and level of care, those are things I'm always personally very careful to to touch on because they're a really weighty charge, I think. But regardless, I think it's clear there's got to be more focus. And even you see him with the the mental errors that that are so easy to avoid, you talk about that disaster of a Denver game on the one instance, not knowing the snap count and going on one and when the snap counts on two. talk about the Raiders game where he thinks it's a run play and it's a pass play and Max Crosby darts in Scott free and only saved by Justin Fields legs to create something out of a disaster situation. So those are the moments where I hear Pat Meyer talk about focus. that I think, you know, ring true when it comes to Broderick Jones, just with a lot of mental errors, missed assignments. And those are the obvious ones. There's probably some, you know, more minutiae that we're not seeing. Uh, it's not quite as obvious on tape that I think this guy's got to really be able to refocus, lock in and not not hurt himself because he's already struggling as it is, getting overmatched. And when you combine that with your own mental errors and just mistakes, then it's a compounding problem. All right, uh, who uh, who else are the position coaches? Uh, Terrell Austin talked about uh, T.J. Watt and, and Alex Highsmith switching sides a little bit against the Giants. Yeah, so they didn't want to be stagnant and kind of force those guys to have to identify where T.J. Watt aligned, and he thinks on that you know big sack fumble recovery that Watt had where the Giants screwed up and didn't motion the tight end over to give uh, the right tackle, Jermaine Illuminor, some help that, you know, because they were kind of flipping water around a little bit, that might have threw them off a little bit. I, I don't know if that's the case. And listen, I mean, he's been stagnant for for a long time. So I I think what happened was, you know, Watt had gone two straight games without a sack. Obviously, he was getting a ton of attention. And so when you kind of go in that drought, you start looking at different options. So, you know, I don't know how much that'll happen going forward. They'll probably maybe do it a little bit. But you know, even then, against the Giants, it was only a handful of snaps. It wasn't a, a ton of snaps, but it was a little change of pace in Pittsburgh trying something different to get what restarted and get the production back up and obviously responded in a big way with two sacks. And by no means do I think we'll see it, you know, if they do uh, uh, continue to kind of do this switching sides moving forward, especially uh, when 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 you're top two in Highsmith or Watt out there. But it probably wouldn't be an, a bad a bad idea to three, four, five times a game uh, to kind of swap it up there. And maybe you get them in a late game situation with a clock running down, where maybe they make an error and forget to switch uh, the tight end to the other side. I went and uh, you told me about the Manning cast and all, and then, then that clip ended up being floated around the internet with Eli Eli Manning saying. They got to move the tight end to, to the other side over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't. And Watt got him. And, and you know, Eli essentially called that. And Peyton said, yeah, you told him, uh, uh, Eli. So, uh, it, you know, once again, I, you know, Watt's obviously more uh, a, a lot more comfortable uh, on the left side. And obviously, Highsmith spent most of his career on, on, on the right side there. But that is something that uh, it will be interesting to track kind of moving forward three, four or five times the game if they do switch sides and obviously with Herbig coming back and the versatility that he gives you to play uh, either side uh, as well may, may allow for you to kind of play with it as well too so it's just something else to track there something to keep defenses or opposing offenses uh, on their toes uh, with, and especially maybe when you get in later game uh, type situations What did, uh, you, did they only do that in the second half? What let me check my chart. It was like I, four times in total, right? Uh, roughly, yeah. I can I can double check here. I I want to say they did a, a little bit earlier than that, but but it was not an immediate thing. Let me see how many snaps Watt played. That would have been on the right side in our charting. Let me just pull that up. Uh, it was a couple of snaps over. I got five snaps in total. You're correct. They've actually they all came. First one came with nine seconds left in the third quarter. Uh, the rest coming. Uh, oh wait, hold on. Well, let me look at this. Uh, it was only two. I only have two snaps here. Uh, yeah, but it was still third quarter, third and fourth quarter for TJ Watt against the Giants. Okay, so they only did it twice. Uh, I think in terms of plays that counted, there was one where there was a penalty uh, that did not count where he lined up on the other okay. side as well. So three in total, but two in terms of plays that counted. He did it three times against the Colts too, okay. and those all came after halftime. Okay. All right. So yeah, just something else to kind of track moving forward here. Right. Right. Um, not, I, I'm kind of spent on the story, even though I think 
us finding it kind of helped create the story in the first place. But do you have any any thoughts on all the comments from Jermaine Illuminor pre-game, post-game? I think people know by now pre-game, we talked about wanting to be on an island against TJ Watt. And then post-game, we're still talking some pretty good smack against TJ Watt, saying he shut him down. Or he didn't say exactly that. He said he didn't do a damn thing for three and a half quarters and just had the one impact play, the sack fumble. Talked about, you know, blamed the, the lack of help for his poor set on the play that Watt had on that strip sack fumble of Daniel Jones. And, you know, overall, was pretty proud of the performance he did and didn't want to really give uh, Watt his flowers. So w- what's your your thoughts on this whole situation? Then they turn around and give uh, Watt uh, uh, AFC Defensive <laughs> uh, Player of the Week uh, after that. Sometimes you just got to stop talking. Don't tweet through it. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, and, you know, J.J. Watt, I think, said it best on the Pat McAfee show. You know, you look at uh, uh, offensive linemen judged against defensive linemen. And if an offensive lineman gives up two big plays, you know, a couple of couple of sacks and one of those a strip sack, uh, he had a bad day. But if a uh, def- if, if an edge rusher, uh, you know, goes most of the game, not not making a huge pass. Pass, pass rush impact, but only, you know, has uh, two, 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 you know, one sack or two sacks and a strip fumble. That's a great day for him. So, uh, yeah, best thing he, he could have done is just say, look, uh, it was a tough matchup and yeah, he got me a couple of times. I'm ready to move on, uh, to, to what y'all, uh, I'm, I'm moving on to Washington is what he probably should have mm-hmm. said there because the more he talked, uh, the more, the bigger the, the, the story that, uh, it became, especially with his pregame comments and everything like that. So, yeah, and then it didn't help us cause to turn around to have T.J. Watt named uh, defensive uh, 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 AFC defensive player of the week on top of it. Kind of, yeah, if someone is well, like Jermaine has been around the league a little bit longer. I, you you would think that even know better, but uh, 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 you know what do we always like to say? Yeah, the uh, the Coca Cola Ford. Uh, uh, whatever uh, was running good today until <laughs> it blew an engine. Yeah, you 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 did a good job until you weren't. You know, so and obviously the uh, the Watt play was very impactful late in that game, and 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 you know came right after the the Steelers had turned the football over themselves, and really it was kind of back in and and we talked about this the other day, and I think you tweeted and and wrote about it as well too. The play right before that with Daniel Jones uh, trying to scramble and get out of the pocket. TJ gets him by the by the uh, by the shoe tops here and brings him down for like a two yard gain on that. That was a very impactful play, and then turns around the very next play and gets the strip sack on top of it there. So uh, there's a reason that guy is the best, uh, one of the best in the NFL. What he does uh, because all it takes is a couple of plays for him on a defensive side of football to make a huge, huge, huge difference in games. I'm a big stand up comedy guy, and one of my favorite album titles is from a guy named Mike Berbiglia and it's titled what I should have said was nothing and that's my message to Jermaine Illuminor in this one I have no problem with him talking confidently pregame about being on an island I can appreciate that I think he was referencing about you know knowing they had a tough situation at left tackle and hoping they could give some extra help over there so I'm good with the pregame comments that's fine but postgame what beats you like that just take the L man don't don't try to as you say you know talk through it tweet through it uh, you're not doing anyone or yourself any favors there. I thought Illuminor did okay against him early on, but then Watt won late. I mean, Illuminor says he was an island for majority of the game. He wasn't. He got help the majority of the game, which is fine. All teams do that as they should against TJ Watt. And then he beat you in the biggest moments overall. So it's it's funny to hear him say, yeah, man, I, I was on an island. I locked him down. And then he talks about on the sack he gave up. Where was my help? I'm supposed to have help. No island here. So it's kind of funny to see those two comments. Uh, work against each other, but yeah, pregame, I'm I'm cool with that. Post game, dude, just just stop. I bet Chris Hubbard's glad uh, that uh, uh, Jermaine did all the talking <laughs> here because uh, Chris Take Hubbard got wore, wore wore like a hat by Alex Highsmith on that other side over there. Yeah, dude. I mean, I think I charted Highsmith for ten pressures. I think other outlets had twelve. I mean, tough spot for Hubbard to be in first game of the season. I don't know if he'd ever started a left left tackle before in the NFL. Good dude, but yeah, that was a uh, that was a tough situation to be in. Yeah, uh, 
definitely a great game by, and look, that was one of my five keys going into this. As I said the other day, uh, I, you know, I thought uh, whoever ended up starting over there, starting over there at left tackle was going to be a tasty matchup uh, for Highsmith, especially knowing how much help that uh, TJ Watt was going to get in this game. So uh, uh, the only thing I, I would say is that I, I you know, and, and it was another uh, aspect of this game was, you know, you had to watch out for uh, Daniel Jones feet and design runs and scramble ability and all like that. Uh, they gave him a lot of respect in that overall and kept those edge guys uh, wide on some of those plays that looked like they might be, uh, uh, you know, zone reads or something like that uh, out of fear of, 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 of Daniel Jones keeping them, uh, you know, kept real wide on the, some of those. And it, it, I think that played into a mm-hmm. little bit on some of those runs uh, that, the, that the Giants wound up having as well, too, against the Steelers defense. Yeah, it is a problem where Pittsburgh's going to struggle, and I really want to watch them against a team like really all the teams they're facing uh, upcoming. They're facing mobile quarterbacks nearly every other step of the way. Baltimore uh, with Lamar Jackson, uh, Jaden Daniels in Washington, uh, Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia, maybe less so with, with a Cleveland or a Cincinnati in terms of the zone read threat, but it has been an issue in, some, in terms of some of those backside and not being able to contain and crash down to get the, the running back to cut back on those zone runs. So Want to see that one going forward. Uh, speaking of honors, since you mentioned TJ Watt, AFC Defensive Player of the Week, there were some October awards handed out to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Chris Boswell named AFC Special Teams Player of the Month for October. He also won it in September, so he's gone back to back. So kudos to him as his fantastic and potentially historic season continues on pace to break the record for most field goals made in a single season. And Beanie Bishop was named defensive rookie of the month for October. That is a league wide award. It is not AFC NFC based. And so Bishop three interceptions, two against the jets and the game winner against the giants on Monday night. And I had the stat that blew my mind when I looked it up. Dave, the last Steeler to win the defensive rookie of the month was Kendrell bell in 2001. He won it twice uh, that year, October and November. So pretty cool company to be in there. Pretty cool stat. Yeah, absolutely. That surprised me as well that it's been that long. I didn't even know they had that award going back that long, <laughs> uh, to be honest with you. And and I was going to fact check you on that and, and figure out how you figured that out. But it ended up being in the uh, in the weekly NFL uh, media release that they put out as well. Oh, OK, yeah, I, I, I looked it up because Pro Football Reference, God bless that site, has the list of all the winners for monthly and all that kind of stuff. And so that's how. I looked it up, but I didn't know they put that in the release, but but very cool. Yeah, uh, good on him. Good month. All right, Dave, anything else going back to the positional coaches? Anything else any of them said? Uh, Tom Arth talked about the quarterback room and, and talked about how well and how graciously Justin Fields has accepted going to the bench and obviously talked about disappointment there, but handling it as well as really any quarterback in that situation could. Yeah, and uh, just rolling back to some of the TV footage, you see those two, uh, Wilson and Fields, having some fun on the sideline together. And uh, one of, was it Orlovsky? One of, one, of the, one of the major media analysts said, look, you, you can't fake that kind of stuff. If, if there was any kind of division between those two guys, you wouldn't kind of see uh, what you saw you know, uh, uh, with shots on the TV the other day. So the good thing is you've got, uh, uh, and look, I mean, we knew this going in, Justin Fields talked, uh, had talked in the past about how he, uh, at, at one point, you know, uh, uh, modeled game, modeled his game after Russell Wilson. And that was kind of a storyline, uh, once both those guys got in the fold there and, and, you know, they're competitive. You sure. I'm sure Justin Fields is disappointed, especially after, you know, getting the team to the record that he got him to, uh, uh, through those first, uh, uh, several games there, but, uh, look, uh, you know, there can only be one starter in this thing. And I, I think he has handled it well. And I think they've got a very strong quarterback room, obviously Kyle Allen being the, uh, uh, the third person in that as well. So yeah, I, I once again, you, you would imagine he's disappointed and why would you be, but, uh, hopefully he can use this as a grow, you know, take what he did, uh, in the first several games that he started for and learn from it, learn from, cause it looked like Wilson was teaching him quite a, or trying to teach him or, or talk about what he saw. I wish I was good at rip, uh, lip reading, uh, especially after a couple of those deep shots that they had shown at one point, it seemed like, uh, Wilson talking about 
you see something. I've read his lips where he says where you want to take a shot or something like that. Mm. Uh, on, 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 at least I think that's what he said. Uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, a good person to learn from, obviously Wilson's been around the league for, for, for quite a while and has seen a lot of stuff and any knowledge that he can pass along, uh, to, uh, to Justin Fields will certainly help. And, you know, we'll obviously wait and see how all this plays out with the quarterback position pass this year, but for the here and now, Russell Wilson's the number one, Justin Fields has got to be ready to go in at any given time moving forward here. We need to hire John Boy. Baseball mm. season's over. He should be free, mm. right? He's the, the king of lip reading. Yeah, I was going to ask you, and I'm going to be a hypocrite for asking a question I hate to be asked whenever I am asked about it, but is there any scenario in which Wilson and Fields are both Pittsburgh Steelers in 2025? I mean, it's, it's definitely plausible. I, I, I think it's plausible. I mean, we'll, we'll How do you think do- that looks? How do you think that, that pans out? For Fields, would he accept to be the backup? Would it become competition again? How do you think it all? Well, I mean, it starts with the contracts first and foremost, right? And yeah. uh, you know, that it is a little early to talk about it because you got you know, half a season to go, and one sure. guy could get injured, or 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 one's play could be, you know, Russell Wilson's play could diminish or something, and Fields get, you know, you just, you, it's still way too too early to tell how this thing's going to turn out. But I mean, for both of these guys to return. Uh, I would think that it would require Wilson playing well for the rest of the year, getting this team in the playoffs and and winning a playoff game, and then signing a you know uh, some sort of a uh, couple couple two three year extension that would pay him in the you know top ten quarterbacks uh, in the league average yearly value, and then uh, essentially Field signing a deal that would probably make him the top paid backup. Uh, technical, technically quarterback in the league, something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to rule it out and say there's 0% chance. It's just hard for me to envision because I think both guys have shown, you know, what we've seen so far. And like you said, so much can and, and could change the rest of the season. But both guys have shown they can be starters or, you know, really compete for that job. And I think, you know, if one if Pittsburgh brings one back, the other's going to sit there and say, I'll, I'll go somewhere else and try to get that better opportunity in a different city. But We'll see, like you said, long ways to go. Yeah, and that's why you know it, it's okay to kind of wonder about it right now. But, I mean, we are at the halfway point right now, and you only have two starts with Wilson underneath his belt, and they have been uh, obviously good, and you know, the team is obviously winning. But you do wonder. I mean, the, uh, we could get three more weeks from now and just wonder why we even had this conversation, sure, you know? Sure. So yeah, these things always are floating. Right. So there's, there, there, there's a lot of football left to be played, but, uh, uh, if both were to return, uh, I imagine it would be something along the scenario that I just painted there. Wilson's in your favorite stat, the adjusted net yards per passing attempt under the sample size is pretty small, but he's at what? 9.34. One of only two quarterbacks in football with at least 50 attempts over nine, him and Lamar Jackson. So Wilson, technically the, the unqualified, but the leader in that category right now. Yeah. And, and technically his, historically, that'll tell you that's unsustainable, sure. you know? Yeah. Uh, but heck, I mean, keeping it, Keeping it over, you know, seven even uh, would be quite an accomplishment of, uh, especially from what we've seen out of the quarterback position uh, over over the last several years here. Even kind of date back to late then, you know, mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to that. So, you know, we'll, we'll obviously look at this at a game by game basis. And man, anytime, anytime this team has a a single quarterback, uh, Justin Net, a uh, single game quarterback, uh, Justin Net yards for passing attempt stat of six point three or better, uh, with the the way this defense has been playing so far against the pass overall, you would think they're going to have a good shot to win every game. You know, so uh, uh, we'll we'll obviously monitor that moving forward. But uh, very impressive, at least statistical numbers when it comes to that stat for two games so far for uh, for 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 Russell Wilson. And this stat really means nothing. I would just do some digging around, some rabbit holes. You know, like you like to go down, Dave. But historically, of quarterbacks who finish seasons, and Wilson's will not end this way. And like you said, probably will regress more towards to me. But of quarterbacks in NFL history that have thrown. For 50 plus attempts in a season with an average, uh, or that uh, average net yards per passing attempt over nine. There's a couple of Steelers on that list, and it's not Ben, 
Mason Rudolph was on that list from last year. Charlie Batch is on that list from long ago. So there's like this weird history of like Steelers initial backups. I mean, Wilson's situation a little bit different, but like, you know, guys have come in midseason in Pittsburgh that have put up those crazy numbers. So what does that mean? Nothing. I just always interesting stat because it's like a list of like 20 names and there's three Steelers on that list and two of them were other Steelers quarterbacks that came in midseason. Uh, and for Russell Wilson, for his career, his his single season high for an adjusted net yards for passing attempt stat is 7.73. And that came back in, during the 2015 season. OK, so that was that went a Super Bowl that year. Is that, uh, Super Bowl that, year? that was let's see, they lost they lost in the divisional round to the Panthers that year. Mm. In 2015, I think that was the Panther Super Bowl season, if memory serves. Uh, Yeah, Charlie Batch in 2006 had only one official start. That was the season opener against Miami. 11.17 that year, but it was only 53 passing attempts. The sample size was was small there, but that was the season I was referencing. All right. So, I mean, if Russell Wilson can keep up and and keep this thing, you know, seven or above, uh, for the second half of the season, this team's going to win a lot of games. Yes, absolutely. Thought Eddie Faulkner, the running backs coach, had an interesting comment about Arthur Smith and credited, you know, credited a bunch of people, coaches, players, certainly not just one guy responsible for the offensive improvement, which still can get better and hopefully will continue to get better under Arthur Smith. But I thought he made an interesting comment about the culture. And I want to pull up the quote here because it's just talking about kind of the, the night and day difference, it seems like, with Matt Canada last year. And Faulkner says, uh, quote, I think the coaches feel that tough blue collar kind of mentality. He uh, has a great atmosphere that he provides for both the coaches and players. Really good coach doing an awesome job, end quote. So, I mean, obviously he's going to say good things about Arthur Smith, but uh, you hear about the atmosphere and kind of the culture. And you hear some of the things about how Canada in his room was run last year where it didn't seem like he was delegating much and wasn't accepting a lot of input from other coaches. We don't know exactly how true that is. Some of the reporting that came out after his dismissal just about a year ago from uh, today. But I think Smith making a good environment for the players, but also the coaching staff is important. And I just think overall and and the results are are obviously as well, too. Everybody's bought into this offense, you know, uh, at, 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 at this point, knows what they're trying to accomplish and things like that. So, I mean, the proof is obviously in the pudding and what you put on tape uh, every week. And, you know, so far, uh, so go good when it comes to that. And, you know, maybe it's uh, uh, maybe it is uh, the kind of the culture and the, and the teaching style of Arthur Smith. Maybe there is more delegating and uh, who knows, but uh, just keep doing what they're doing right now. And and, you know, the, the uh, putting the finished product out there uh, to, to, to to build upon what's been successful so far. And well, you know, they're going to win more games. So uh, and, that, and that's the goal of this thing. Yeah. And I think it's the. The comment's been made by myself. I think they mentioned it on Pat McAfee earlier this week, and we've talked about it before, Dave, but there seems to be a sense of humility and humbleness from Arthur Smith that, you know, he could be a super entitled kind of dude. His dad is worth $6 billion. He owns FedEx. Like, I mean, he is the son of Frederick Smith. And so this is a guy that could have that silver spoon in his mouth and feel like the world owes him something. But he's really worked his way up from being being a grad assistant at North Carolina, quality control coach in the NFL, working his way up to head coach in Atlanta before obviously getting fired and coming to Pittsburgh and just doing his job and doing a good job at that. So I don't know. I think that's pretty impressive to kind of know his story and, and kind of obviously we don't know Arthur Smith. I'm not pretending like we're, we're having a beer or anything, but just what we can tell and what people say about him seems like a really good dude. And, and his background, you know, I think is, is pretty, pretty unique. He looks like a Steelers coach too. He looks like a Steelers tight end is what he it's looks a, like. The mustache, yeah, yeah, but but for sure. Uh, I uh, Danny Smith uh, spoke for quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of time the other day. Yeah, we're hearing a lot from Danny Smith lately, which is fantastic. But did have an eleven minute interview. I don't know if there was any singular comment that that struck me. He did speak a couple of days ago or last week or something, so we already kind of heard some initial thoughts. I, I, I what what I took away from that was more kind of forward thinking. He said he spoke with Roger Goodell pregame before the Giants game. Goodell was in town uh, to do some different events around the Pittsburgh area and said he spoke with Goodell pregame and kind of got the impression there's going to be a pretty long discussion to be had about the future of kickoffs. 
and the new rule changes, the uh, dynamic uh, kickoff that got instituted in 2024 on that one year trial run. So, you know, we'll see where it goes. I'm sure there'll be some changes. How do you think it's gone eight weeks in league wide? Do you like it? Do you want to scrap it? What are your feelings? I'm still open to seeing it potentially monitor. I mean, uh, modified, you know, maybe moving to moving to kickoff point of back a little bit, but even Danny Smith said, uh, we, you know, we're, we're going to have to see how this plays out. All we, all we have is all we have up until this point. It'll be interesting to see how much weather and, and, and cold, you know, cold and snow and, and wind and all like that kind of impacts, uh, you know, how, you know, where the ball lands, how many touchbacks there are and kind of go from there. But uh, I, I would like to see it tweaked a little bit, at least from from what we have seen so far. But it does feel like this is going to be an ongoing conversation and, and one definitely. I don't think we we're done seeing this thing uh, modified overall uh, uh, where it comes to them trying to get at least more returns done. Sure. I bet they'll tweak it. I don't know exactly how touchbacks and where that gets place that was discussed pretty heavily even right before the season began the 30 to 35 maybe there's a change there I, I like it overall returns are up injuries seem down that was the intent of the rule although in Pittsburgh returns really are bought up they only have seven kick returns all season Cordero Patterson who was signed four kick returns does not have a single one granted he's missed a month with that that ankle injury but Pittsburgh's not been returning the football much in his absence anyway so that's where Smith says it's hard to evaluate, as you say, whether hopefully we'll give Pittsburgh a better look at that going forward. But it's really been kind of status quo with the Steelers, where it's been a bunch of touchbacks. So they are, of course, kicking off a bunch. And I think they're doing a good job. And they have different people out there. Defense alignment are now viable candidates. Isaiah Loudermoke's a mainstay on the kick coverage unit. So I don't know. I like the rule overall. I'm sure there'll be some tweaking as there always is after one year, but I, I don't want to scrap it. I don't want to go back to the old way. I think what they have right now is a good framework and probably some adjustments to be made and it'll be, be, be a pretty good change. All right. Uh, one other thing. The one thing that st- stuck out to me about Danny Smith is he was asked about which players, something along the line of which players does he feel has benefited the most from kind of his coaching and what they're trying to accomplish and all like that. He, uh, Danny Smith's an old wise guy. He did not take the bait when it comes to that. He says, look, I don't want to talk about any, and I'm paraphrasing here. Didn't want to talk about any one player because I'm, uh, I'd surely leave off, uh, forget somebody. And then that guy would be in my office saying, Hey, what, what, what did I do that I didn't get mentioned there? So, uh, he's definitely been around the block a few times when it comes to talking to the media, he loves his guys, his guys love him, and he's not going to single out one, two, three, four guys because he'll miss number five, number six, number, you know, on, on down the list there. So I, I thought that was a cute way of, of, of him handling that. He was also asked about being, you know, uh, uh, Danny Smith forever in so many words with, uh, all the social media stuff, uh, that seems to, uh, look, he's easy to clip out on, on, <laughs> on any given season, a game or two for, for his reactions. But we've obviously had more of those, uh, this year. And he claims that for the most part, he doesn't look at them. Uh, or he's, I, I'm too damn busy. You know, I, I got too much work to do. Uh, but he also said, you know, I, I guess it's so many words that if a player says, Hey, Hey Danny, did you see this? And if he does not have to wait for them to cue it up on their phone or whatnot, then, then he might look at it. So I know he sees that stuff, uh, uh, out there, probably not as much as we'd like to think that he maybe sees that stuff, but he has to, he, he sees it and knows he's a meme uh, star, uh, 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 if you will, but overall he doesn't go searching that kind of stuff out and you're only as good as what you get done as the next game. And he knows that as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. I think he's, he sees it cause he's shown it. It seems to be, do you, do you think Danny Smith knows what a meme is? Do you no. think if we, I don't think he does, no. I don't think he does, but that's okay. As long as he's doing the great job that he's doing, then I am a okay with that. And yeah, I mean, he talked about obviously not wanting to name specific players, but I thought also in that answer was he talked about, he works with practice squad guys and goes over tape with them, even knowing that for that week, they're highly unlikely to get a hat and be part of the game plan. But you never know when your number is going to get called. Talk about you know some of the guys that have been promoted or guys that have gotten signed or guys that started inactive. Terrell Edmonds, for example, was signed and did not dress his first couple of weeks. And now he's doing a really good job as a gunner. And he's kind of he's kind of recreated his career a little bit, a little DHB kind of arc, being a great gunner, special teamer, a niche package defensive player working in dime right now 
We'll see how that changes when Cam Sutton comes back. But he think he and, of course, Pierre have done a really good job of covering punts. And look, this is something that we talk about every year during uh, tr- uh, training camp and the preseason and watching these uh, special teamers uh, d- uh, decisions because we know, look, uh, every team values it, but the Steelers really, really, really value it, especially with Danny Smith and all. And that's why it's important to, uh, to, uh, to watch that stuff. Uh, during, you know, that's why we have, that's why I needle you with questions who was doing, <laughs> doing this. And this is why I mean, part of why I like the preseason as well, too, because so I can track, you know, who's doing what on, on punt to who's the, who's the backup up back. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, who, 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 who were the gunners at certain points of the game, those kind of things. Yeah. Jonathan Ward, the running back, for example, was on the practice squad to begin the year and he's got a hat and had a really big impact on special teams, had a tackle two weeks ago against the jets, had a key block on the Calvin Austin punt return touchdown. So, um, yeah, I mean, really, really impactful stuff. Austin, by the way, was also named AFC special teams player of the week for that big punt return touchdown, the catalyst to the victory in that game. So love us some Danny Smith and hope for that success going forward. All right. Uh, any other uh, coaches stick out major? I think that covered it pretty well. There's one I want to talk about that kind of ties in with our all 22 review about Darnell Washington and Alfredo Roberts. I think accidentally, but on purpose, spilled the beans about what his weight might actually be. He's listed at 264 at the combine. When he came out, he was 272. Roberts dropped a 300 plus reference to Darnell Washington uh, when he spoke with the media on Wednesday. And just going back to the tape, Dave, I-, I didn't realize how good of a game Darnell Washington had until I really focused on his snaps individually against the Giants. He had the catch for 29 yards, his longest of his career. That was obvious, but him as a blocker, I mean, he was a bully out there. This was his best scheme of his career. And I'm really excited about where he can go from here. Yeah, especially uh, late in that game, him in that wrestling match with I forget uh, who the uh, who was that player that uh, they tussled on the ground uh, with D tackle. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, late in the game there, but uh, I think you're seeing more of him. Uh, 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 especially trying to finish these things and playing through the whistle. Uh, his technique has gotten better. Uh, it's like having a tackle out there, especially at 300 something pounds. And boy, just uh, to go back and watch the all 22 of that uh, on, on that big play that he had, how would you like to try to uh, 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 run and drape yourself all over that guy uh, uh, running down the field? You know, not the twitchiest guy whatsoever, but uh, you know, straight line, he's absolutely fine. And he he was a beast to kind of cover in that situation. And in, in one of the, and what, what is you know, a rare occurrence for him getting the football uh, kind of vertically down the field in those situations there. And uh, Russell, Russell Wilson put that ball right on him too, uh, moving out of the pocket, made that an easy catch for him. Uh, and then, you know, he obviously got some yak after that. So don't think that uh, posing defensive coaches aren't having to at least uh, 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 now a account for not only those kind of, uh, you know, boot outs and, and, and things that, uh, he has done in his career, but now you have to wonder, is this guy going to kind of, you know, block and release real quick and go up the field? And do we have to account with him account for him? And, you know, you, you don't, you put a smaller guy on him. You're going to lose that if it's a 50, 50 ball, uh, and, and then try to tackle him after the catch. So yeah, it was a very nice game for, uh, for, for, for Darnell Washington. And look, if you, if you make one more guy, a, a semi threat in that offense, that makes everybody else who are legitimate threats, even more threats. And it really helps your play pass game. I think has every reception he had this year come off a of play action. It might have, which is fine, but it's a really good mm-hmm. component of it because you're, you know, you have to. You, usually, when he's out there, you got big people out there. Teams are thinking run. You're selling run. Wilson's play fakes are, are really convincing, and you get you know guys open that way. But even on that catch, like the finish was great. But watch the route. Watch him swim over the DB and help get a step on him and kind of break away. DB falls down. Washington stays on his feet and almost scored on that one too. Just you know, couldn't toe the line there. So. I thought the route was really impressive too at the top of his uh, top of his route to swim over and, and get some space. I agree. Great game from him. Great to see. 
let's say with the offense, you all 22 in this one day. What else did you see? Good, bad, ugly. What were your thoughts? I tell you what, Najee, uh, uh, to me, seems to be pressing the line uh, a lot better, uh, almost getting right up on the hip or the butt of uh, of some offensive linemen and really, really pressing it hard to the line before uh, making his cuts. He looks, at, and I think you said this the other day, looks as nimble as he's ever looked. Uh, especially, you know, in, uh, in, you know, since he was drafted there, yeah, but, a looser uh, runner feels so yeah, looser, right? yeah, you know, he, he, you know, he's able to put his foot in the ground and cut and all like that. Uh, remember, was it last year that he was coming off that, he had that supposedly that plate in the, in the shoe and all like that. But I mean, you, you look at first half of the seasons, especially, you know, compared to, uh, to, to the last couple, uh, that he's had, uh, been a far more productive runner. Yeah. The blocking's been, uh, better, uh, overall there, but I, I think one of the main things when going back through the all 22 in the end zone looks, especially it just, it looks like he's doing a better job of, of, of pressing the offensive line, uh, before making, uh, some of those cuts. And he had a couple, he had, you know, three, four five good, very nice cuts, uh, in this game, uh, that, uh, that, that led to some nice yardage. Yeah, I've been impressed. And like you said, the blocking helps, but ability to kind of, and when you say press, just to explain that for people that don't know, that's really him just trying to get the linebacker to act like he's going to go one way and then cut back the other. Yeah, you want you want to set up a read type situation, and the closer that you can get to uh, to you know the the hip uh, or or almost you know, on the butt of your offensive lineman, right on the back of his feet, by you know, essentially kind of try to hide behind them, uh, it makes you know the uh, defender a box safety or, a, or or an off the ball linebacker or whoever's up the middle there, uh, you know even somebody is trying to uh, to you know defensive lineman uh, trying to control his offensive lineman and flash one way. Uh, or the other it makes them kind of commit uh one way and you can read that the further that you press up because you're not actually committed to a to a hole or a gap uh uh, along those lines there. So the further that you, whenever you hear somebody say running backs, press the line better, you know, that's what they mean. They're, 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 they're pressing it and trying to get the defensive players, uh, to commit more and gives them a better opportunity to kind of read the situation behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I agree. Well said there. Good commentary. And I'm excited whenever hopefully Patterson comes back for week 10 to have this room available and healthy for really the first time all season. I know early in the year, week one, what week two, they were all dressed, but you had Warren dealing with his hamstring from the summer. And then he had the knee in week three against the Chargers. And so there were times where the group was together and they were all playing, but they really weren't a hundred percent. And I think when this one, you know, Harris is obviously healthy and, and Warren's good to go now. And Patterson coming off the ankle, if he can dress for this Washington game, then it's for the first time all season. All three guys are really truly available to you, and that's really exciting. Yeah, and we know uh, we know uh, Jalen can hit a home run. We know we we uh, Cordell Patterson, you know, has had a couple of big runs already this season in in limited play. So uh, that's a three headed monster that'll be tough to stop, especially you get Frazier back in this thing, and and you know, maybe Broderick Jones hopefully improve a little bit in the second half of the season, and uh, Mason McCormick more snaps for him, and Dan Moore's been good over at left tackle. Uh, Sam Ballo did a very good job, I thought, uh, with some blocks in this game, uh, moving heck a couple of those. He displaced uh, Demarcus uh, 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 Lor- uh, Dexter Lawrence in this game as well, too. So uh, that was a tall task that the interior of this offensive line had in this game. In the Giants, uh, were they were they one hundred percent perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, but uh, I think for the most part, I mean, especially with the running game totals uh, go and the uh, the number of uh, number of uh, nice runs that they had, I thought they did a good job uh, overall. Uh, especially with a guy like uh, uh, McCollum in there and, you know, Mason McCormick still trying to feel his way around. And, but I, I thought Sam Muller really stuck out well on tape uh, for the most part in this one. When you see this team finish over four in the red zone, how alarmed are you? Obviously really disappointing to not score in those situations and keep that game close. Is that, is that more of a just a fluky thing? Is there a longer, con- longer view concern you have of that? that poor number, the 28th in red zone offense this year. I, I don't want to explain it all the way here, but obviously you had the one taken back, uh, the first one there 
you know, on the, uh, on the, on the Broderick Jones face mask. So, uh, that, that was a, uh, that was a touchdown that you should have had. Anytime you have a, you know, holding penalty, regardless of where you are, uh, in, 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 in an offensive possession that could, that can kill a drive. It was just too much for them to overcome, uh, once they got that. But I thought, uh, the actual play that scored was fine. I mean, Pickens, I thought ran a very nice route coming, uh, left to right on that kind of a stair step out there, got himself free. It was a very easy pick and catch well designed uh, uh uh nice read by by russell wilson there so you just didn't get it you committed a penalty uh explain you know i don't once again I, i'm not going to give them excuses there but i mean that that's what happened you get behind the sticks in that situation you just could not recover uh offensively and a lot of you know that that ends up hurting a lot of offenses any penalty especially a holding penalty uh down in the red zone there uh they, what was more concerning, I think, was I think it was the second trip down there. Uh, the uh, the play to uh, Van Jefferson, uh, that was a similar play to what they had called in the game against the Jets, where you had Pickens and Jefferson to one side, although you had their position switched and you had a little bit different spacing uh, overall in there. Uh, this time you had uh, 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 Jefferson running the, the vertical uh, in that. But once again, you had the, the uh, defensive backs were kind of confused. And both those defensive backs went with uh, went with George Pickens on the out there. And I thought Russell Wilson, I, I, I thought read it, read it well. Uh, uh, the, the Russell Wilson threw the ball uh, to the right side back behind Jefferson there. And if you watch uh, Russell Wilson's reaction after the play, point to his right, he expected Jefferson to either sit down or break that thing back out the other way because he was free uh, in the situation. There was only the middle of the field safety and Jefferson uh, essentially ran himself uh, in, 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 in to that player. And that's why I believe Russell Wilson put that ball where he did. So is that a matter of those two guys not getting enough time together and maybe some uh, uh, seven shots or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I, I, I chalk it up as a miscommunication between those two, but uh, that miscommunication cost you a very easy touchdown because once again, I think the, the, the you had two defensive backs go with uh, George Pickens on that and you, you should have had a touchdown in that situation. Yeah, it did cost you. I think that's a slight adjustment. It's just it's probably that Jefferson ran the route as intended, but just working off leverage and working on the defense played you. And, and like you said, that comes down to just chemistry and getting the reps and making a mistake and learning from it and correcting it for the next time. So, yeah, my overall takeaway, despite the ugly over four number. And then the very was, next, uh, let me let me let me add this real quick. Mm -hmm. The very next play, I thought uh, Russell should have seen Calvin Austin. Uh, he did late, yeah, but we didn't see him initially, and then right. that ball got got deflected. I think it might be a touchdown if that ball isn't tipped by whatever lineman tipped it. Yeah, there. but I'm I'm talking almost right at the snap mm -hmm. there, uh, right right uh, even before Calvin puts puts the mailbox flag up the first time, <laughs> you know, uh, and then he's jumping up and down, waving his arms, you know. After that, then he works his way across the the rest of the field. It it just it felt like Russell maybe should have seen that and uh hit that on his back foot you know yeah i don't know what the read or the progression was on that play but certainly another missed opportunity but my overall takeaway is it was a lot of fluky stuff i mean you don't want to be over four it's got to get cleaned up regardless of the reason but you had the pickens not getting his foot down you had the penalty that took off a touchdown the miscommunication with jefferson uh the other one late in the game it's third and goal dan moore goes out Calvin Anderson comes in, probably gives up a sack with your backup left tackle. So a lot of kind of stuff like that. Where I don't think it was scheme. I don't think it was this overall problem from the offense as a whole. Just a bunch of weird stuff that, you know, hopefully won't happen again that you really can't, you know, coach away, you know, guy getting his foot down. I mean, you can coach that, but but my point is just some some weird stuff that took touchdowns off the board. So I, I don't want to say it's not a concern because you are still overall this year 28th in red zone offense, which is not the number you want to be at. But I don't think in this game there was a scheme issue or a rust issue or anything like that that said there's a there's a big alarm bell in the future. 
Yeah, look, you just you got to put the ball in the end zone, though. You can't. Mm-hmm. We 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 can't keep talking about these every week and say, well, you know, everything was fine, but they didn't. They didn't finish. You know, they they just got to start finishing some of the these. And and there were obviously a couple of these that uh, that were there that should have been scores that were uh, well designed and and uh, looked like they could be easily executed, uh, and they weren't. Yeah, he did only have one offensive touchdown in this game. The other one came from the Austin punt return score. So that's not a great stat, but yeah, I think Pittsburgh has still shown progress here offensively. Yeah. They're, look, they're, they're, they're moving the football in these games as of late, especially with yeah. Russell Wilson are pushing the football down the field. I think that's evidence. Uh, uh, they're not turning the football over for the most part. Uh, the uh, even for this amount of sacks that they're taking per uh, uh, per game, uh, the uh, the the you know the ability to push football and the big plays that they're getting down the field is help counteracting that. As far as uh, that that stat goes, man, imagine what what his stat would be if he didn't have a couple extra of these sacks in here because sacks count in that adjusted net yards for passing attempt stat. So uh, just start finishing in the red zone and and, and you know what, one of the keys obviously uh, that I had in this game and and it was a cap- an obvious one was you know, need need more fluidity in this offense early in games. It'd be good uh, the next time that we talk about this team going down the field and scoring a touchdown on their opening drive. I think you saw fluidity. I think you need a new F word for the Commanders game. Finish. You got fluidity. Can you finish some of these drives? That'll be key. Any other thoughts? You're all 22 offensively, Dave. Uh, no. Uh, N- not not anything maybe that I don't think that we've already haven't already covered up until this point. Uh, you know, my main takeaways I think was uh, uh, Najee pressing the line better and uh, us talking about a few of those plays that they did finish those touchdowns on. All right, Dave, flipping over to the defensive side of the ball, the all 22 in this one. Why was the run defense so bad? Why do you think they struggled and gave up a buck 45 to Tracy and even more than that against the Giants collectively? You know what? Live, it 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 felt worse than what it did. I think after the fact. Now, I'm, I'm once again, I'm not. Uh, look, Carl Dunbar said, uh, if 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 Daddy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, especially yeah. when it when it came uh, to some of these runs. But uh, I went back through this thing overall uh, and sorted uh, successful runs. Uh, out and specifically uh, uh, runs of 10 yards or more. Uh, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven runs of 10 yards or more. Now, is that too many? Absolutely it is. But it felt like uh, live and the first TV watch through, uh, which I do in a hurry, obviously late, especially late at night, it, it, it felt like there was more than that. Uh, now I think there was like three more runs that were six, six and seven. Uh, but when you look at the totality of the number of runs that they had, which was like what, 20, uh, 23, 24, how many running back to- total running back runs did they have in this game? I'll have to check, but that number sounds Roughly correct. All right. Uh, I think they had 11, what you would deem successful runs. Now, obviously, if you're in a third and one situation and you get one yard, that's a successful run. Uh, 22 what, official running back runs. Okay. 22. And I think, uh, I think they had 11, 10 or 11 successful runs in total. Let me see if I can sort this out. Are you counting the Daniel Jones sneak as one of those? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Just curious. What about 50%? Uh, success yeah. Rates? Yeah. And I, and obviously you want it to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, more around the lines of 43, 44% in there. Uh, I think the most disturbing thing were the longer runs and the amount of yardage yeah. that, that, that those covered, uh, you had obviously one that was a 45 yarder that not only how many times we talk about, Stealing in a in a in a in, a, in an offensive running game, uh, you get a double explosive play uh, on the ground running the football. That's stealing. You get one that goes that amount of distance and ends up in the end zone, and that's 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 a double theft against you right there. So that one hurt. Uh, I, I think uh, that was one of those ones where Highsmith was wide on the outside, maybe trying to protect against 
you know, uh, Daniel Jones taken off with the football. The rest of the inside got got washed out. There were a couple, uh, I think a defensive lineman and a, and a linebacker stacked on top of each other. Somebody I think didn't fill a gap properly. They, they couldn't get off blocks as far as the, the, uh, the safety was up in, 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 in that one. And they got through and they just couldn't track them down. Uh, that was obviously painful, uh, to watch there. And then you had another one was 26 yards. I believe that one was two off the uh, left side of the offense, right side of the defense as well too and then the other one that stuck out was that 17 yarder that they just could not get him down on the ground on yeah. uh and that one was also to the left side so uh, i think a common theme on all of those was the inside linebackers not getting off blocks i think there were some missed gaps within that and then one of those obviously it might have been the 26 yarder or I think both of those big ones was uh, a lot of respect, I think, to Daniel Jones uh, by by uh, by Alex Highsmith. And and one of those we talked about the other day, boy, you could drive two trucks side by side uh, through 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 one of those holes there. So uh, they just they uh, there's about four or five plays that. And and you could go through any game like this, right? Uh, if they don't allow you, know, if they clean up these four or five plays, you know, that 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 could be the difference in the ball game. Well, uh, I think it's easy to pinpoint the four or five running plays uh, in this. So was it bad as a whole? Yes. Was it, did it feel, did it, was it as bad as, as a watching the, as a watching the 22 tape in totality and looking at the stats? No, but that doesn't excuse it all the way. They've, they've got to be better than what they were. Uh, you just cannot give up that volume of runs that go uh, uh, 10 yards or more. And, and once again, there were, I think, four of those in total. And I mean, if you're going to give up a 10 yard run, make sure it's just 10 yards, not the 17, 26 mm -hmm. and 45 variety. Yeah, you still give up a buck 56 to the running backs and the Giants who weren't exactly a well-oiled running machine coming into this game either. Although I think they just had to run the ball a lot to really evaluate how quality of a running team they were. But yeah, I think twofold. They just weren't physical enough at the line. I thought the Giants controlled the line of scrimmage. I thought tackling was an issue. That one that you referenced that, that went for, what, 17? That should have been like an eight-yard gain. Right. And the running back just keeps churning in Pittsburgh. I didn't think Pittsburgh rallied super well in terms of trying to get guys on the ground. They were kind of more, I let the other guy take him. He'll, he'll, he'll get him down and just want to see more hats of the football, see a little more guys involved trying to punch that football. I was the second and third guys to come in. And then, as I mentioned earlier, when you have the threat of the quarterback, mobility as you have in daniel jones who's a, who's a better athlete than people give him credit for this guy can guy almost had what an 80 yard touchdown before he tripped over his own two feet in open grass a couple of years back so when you have those zone reads you know pittsburgh's edge guys get held they can't crash down and play you know backside and uh track things down that way as watt and highsmith are so good at doing they have to respect that and that really widens the backside cutback for tracy and in, in the running game which you saw at least twice in this one so I think those two things overall, and yeah, they give up the 45 yard touchdown, give up 12 yards. Okay, fine. But a 45, even if, you know, you make it a 43 yard gain, you get some blades of grass to defend and you can try to get a goal line situation, goal line stop there. You know, you want to at least do that. So give up a 45 yard touchdown is not something that, that happens too often in Pittsburgh, but I'll still chalk it up to more of a one-off or just a bad game overall. And I'm not going to assume that it's a, a huge problem or this will be a trend going forward, but though we tested, they got some good run games they're going to face especially when they take on Baltimore in week 11. Uh, when you look to uh, at, 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 at the successful runs, let me sort this back out here real quick. Uh, when you look at successful runs that they had their first, where is my column here? Uh, their first three uh, of the game. And one of them was a, it was the Daniel Jones up the middle for two yards on the sneak, but their first uh, three runs of the game were successful runs, even though they went for uh, five, four and two yards. So uh, once again, you know, not a lot of yardage there, but it kept them, you know, they came out running a football and they, they, you know, they, they had success that way because they were getting five and four yard, five yards on first down and 10. That's a successful run. Second mm -hmm. down when needing five yards, if you get, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, 60% or more, uh, of, of the yardage needed, that's a successful run. So obviously, uh, 
four yards when you need five is a successful run. That set up a, 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 a third and short situation, and they got uh, our third and one, and they actually got two yards on that on the sneak, and you know, kind of, kind of a snowball from there. And and if you look at in totality as far as successful runs go, uh, let me I got too wide of a spreadsheet uh, here. I already lost where my successful column went. There, oh, here it is. Uh, three, four, five, six successful runs on there, and this includes the uh, uh, the the quarterback sneak as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine, seven of your first ten. No, six of your first ten were successful runs. Yeah, not good. You got them into a rhythm early and helped them get some points. They got field goals on their, what, first two drives, and they kind of got some momentum, and it helped them stick with the running game throughout when they had success early. They said, okay, let's actually commit to the run game for once. And, of course, the game being relatively close got away a little bit in the second half. The Giants had that comeback. But, but yeah, that was just, you know, the Giants set the tone early, and Pittsburgh should be the team setting the tone early. All right. And, and yeah, they have struggled early in some games on some first drives, let teams go down the field with some of that mixed in on mm-hmm. the run. Yeah, it's not been a great first drive, offense or defense this season. So that's something to to watch for the second half of the year. Any other thoughts here uh, defensively with the All-22, Dave? Uh, they got got on that first uh, on that first one uh, to slate down the middle of the field uh, there uh, in in what was that kind of cover three type situation middle of the field safety he did a great job had protection uh, they had max protection on play action fake sucked everybody up and he looked uh, mink off to the other side and yeah, just ran away from uh, from uh, uh, I guess that was Dante Jackson on that side over there and got got down the middle of the field. That was one of them there. Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember what the what the second one was that it got busted on Slayton. by. do you remember that one? Uh, that was the third down with Jackson again. The missed tackle. That was second half. If that's okay. The I think you're referring to. And they they got beat on a square in uh, later on, and then they got uh, deeper down the field on that one that we talked about neighbors right in front of the sticks on that third and 16, 17, whatever it was uh, there. They didn't do a great job overall at, at kind of defending the screen game. It did feel like, especially early on in this game, uh, a little bit too much cushion. Uh, it felt like not recognizing that they'll see more of that moving forward. Uh, just too many explosive plays as a whole, especially when some of those came on the ground. I mean, you're going to get got on 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 occasion, like like happened with that early play uh, down the field to Slayton. Uh, as far as coverages went, I thought they did a good job of 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 of. Uh, mixing in the blitz and 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 using you know cover one man, some cover two, cover three, obviously, but it did it it did still seem a little staticky, and, and but that's that's kind of who they are, I think. Uh, you know, they they might want to switch it up with with a robber type situation if they're showing too high. Sometimes maybe start let Jackson, I mean, uh, 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 okay. uh Mika go back. Uh, and 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 have Elliot maybe come down in 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 robber type situation to maybe try to uh, confuse some offenses here and there. I mean, I think they mixed things up pretty decently. I thought they were rotating a, a fair amount. They came out playing a lot of cover one early, and Jones read things well. They moved the safety. They got some one on one shots. That post to Slate on that first drive was a big play. Pittsburgh played some more cover two later on, and that's when the Giants were running some more of those dagger concepts and hitting the the dig route sort of the post route downfield. Hit that seam ball in cover two uh, that Edmonds is, Edmonds is not good in coverage just never oh, the been. tight end down the middle of the field too that was against a tampa two i think right but i mean mm-hmm. sometimes guys are just going to make a that was a great throw and a great catch it was it was but Edmonds i think minka was has, running with him on that one wasn't he no that was Edmonds. Okay, Edmonds, Edmonds has negative ball skills and that's remained true in his return to pittsburgh i mean he's done fine as a dime player uh but you'll get back cam sutton and and should mention that you know when when sutton returns how do you think him and beanie how do you think that role will look does and you lose playing time. How did they integrate Sutton back into this thing? You got to get him on the field, you know. So uh, it will be. I think it'll come obviously at 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 Beanie's expense. But uh, I, I think Beanie has grown enough where he's still going to be out there in certain situations. 
Yeah, I don't know if this is either or. I mean, we'll have to see. There's some flexibility there, which is a good thing. But could you see Sutton just come in in dime packages and be yeah. that 60B? Could it come at Casey's expense? And because and what they've been doing is in dime is that Elliot's been coming off the field. Casey's been coming on the field whenever he's been healthy. And they've had, uh, you know, him be the the, the 60B. Um, or Ed, I should say that Edmonds is a 60B, but Casey's going out there at safety as well. And then Elliot's coming off the field. So could you replace Sutton with Edmonds, Sutton with uh, Casey? I think those things are more likely than taking Beanie off the field. I tell you something that's been on tape quite a bit, especially in kind of short third, third and, uh, you know, three or, or two ones, uh, 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 when they come out in man type situations and all like that, they, they tend to like to run that out, and try to rub off, uh, a motioning, uh, slot defender coming across. We've seen, we've seen them do that against Beanie several times this year. I imagine whoever's out there, if, if Sutton comes in in those situations, they're going to continue to see that. So they, you know, I, I don't know if, if, if obviously the quarterback that you play is going to play a role in that you might, well, you know, you're obviously in, in, behind the chains in those situations uh, it comes down to more execution, how effective the rub is, but we, we have seen, I think more than a few times this year in, in, in third and modest type situations against man type situations, uh, they'll motion and, and kind of those kind of that West coast motion where they, they get them moving at the ball and try to rub off that defender. That's trying to follow them across the field. Yeah. I think that's one reason why Pittsburgh has played a lot of zone this year. They've, they've had some good tendency breakers. There's been times where they'll have usually it's been beanie travel with a receiver in motion but they play zone where you think okay he's traveling he's probably in man oh no it's own coverage they've had some times where Peyton Wilson's been out wide on on a running back and you think okay they're probably in man if the linebacker's walking out but no they're in zone I think they've had some good tendency breakers it's really been more, more miscommunication that I think has hurt Pittsburgh than anything the offenses are doing where Pittsburgh's just not communicating and passing things off effectively and that just gotten them into some trouble so clean those things up and they've made progress there I think we'll do them some good going forward. But yeah, I think Sutton just offers flexibility. He can line up literally anywhere in the secondary, slot corner, deep half safety, deep middle, outside corner, can, can play everything, wear a lot of hats. And so that'll be good to have, you know, unlock Minka even more. But yeah, I think Sutton probably plays a dime role as a 60B, where it probably is, comes at the expense of Edmonds, I'll say, more so than it will at Beanie Bishop's expense. Uh, I think overall, one fire. I mean, you just you got to limit these explosive plays that you saw uh, in totality. You know, you you want you, you're going to get got here and there, uh, three or four a game. But they gave up. What did I say? They gave up here uh, six totality. I think in this game. Now one of those was an eight yard gain with a 15 yard roughing uh, penalty mixed in there. So I guess technically they gave up five. But uh, they were they were lengthy ones. They were 25, 26, 36, 43, and 45. And obviously the 45 ended up in the end zone on the ground. Yeah, uncharacteristic of the Steelers team. And if you're wondering, by the way, when I went back to the tape, I wanted to see that rough in the passer call of why they called it because it looked clean. But there was helmet to helmet contact from Highsmith and Jones as Highsmith kind of jumped up as Jones is releasing that football. They kind of smacked face mask and incidental, but. That's going to be a clear call. You know, any helmet contact forcible to the quarterback, much less your own helmet contacting the quarterback. So going to get called every single time. So I was wondering the call. They didn't show a good replay on it, but that is the right call the refs made. So likely to be fined on Saturday. And then uh, obviously they appeal everything these days. So uh, we would expect to see Highsmith on the sheet, right? Do they do they find every rough in the passer? I forget. Is that the know. is that the mentality? I mean, it, to me, it didn't seem to the level of finable. But I don't I, I don't know if what the the rule is if you have to find every rough in the passer if there's discretion there. To me, it wasn't worth a fine. But I truthfully don't really know their their protocol and policy too well. But it wouldn't be surprising if he was. Then it's going to be you know, we'll we'll know why. All right, we'll find out in twenty three and a half hours. Right. Yep. Four four p.m. Or, Saturday. No, twenty six and a half hours. I guess. We know that uh, when that sheet comes out, we're checking for it for sure. I thought Pittsburgh, well, they didn't blitz a ton in this game. They sh they've shown more sim pressures the last two weeks and kind of gotten more in vogue with how other teams are doing it. And often they'll bluff and, and drop out, but they've shown a little more aggression at the snap and try to mug those A-gaps and put some strain on the protection and really help convince teams to keep guys in and help pinch their protection, which might help create one-on-one matchups for guys like Highsmith and, uh, and, and TJ Watt. 
and also had, had a little bit of a Lebeau flair in this game with some of the Fire concepts, X. those Fire X, those Sim Pressures. They even dropped Dean Lowry in the coverage one time, which I didn't even see watching it uh, on the TV tape. I saw it in the All-22, and so first time that's happened all season. So th- it wasn't a fire zone. It wasn't a traditional Lush 5, 3D fire zone, but it was just kind of a little little wrinkle there that kind of brought you back to some Dick Lebeau type stuff. So you're seeing some little tweaks on the edges in the game plan, which I think has been been fun to watch. And one time when they sent uh, Patrick Queen, Daniel Jones wanted no part of that on the free runner. Threw that one into the ground. Oh, yeah, that kind of late blitz there. Yeah, they ran another coffee house stunt with Terrell Edmonds. Oh, the coffee house has not been super effective. It's because it takes some time, but you got some fun little stuff, little nuggets on on tapes, some Easter eggs to, to check out. All right. All right, Dave, anything else there? I think uh, I think we covered the, the all 22 pretty well. All right. Uh, shall we get to uh, our picks this week? Is that the point of the show we're at? Uh, we're running long gear, which we always do. Apologize, but it's a Friday show. It's always a long one. A couple other things I want to touch on here quickly. Should mention this one. Maybe should have mentioned it earlier, but you know, it's, I don't want to pretend like it's going to consume all of our news. But Deontay Johnson is back in the AFC oh, North, yeah. Dave, but not in Pittsburgh, which we know legally could not be traded back to the Steelers. He's now a Baltimore Raven. Basically, Baltimore getting him for essentially nothing from Carolina, and we'll finish out the year with the Ravens and see Pittsburgh twice this season, including in week 11. Johnson speak with the media and said he's looking forward to that game, but he's focusing on the here and now. And as you said, Baltimore going to play Denver this week and then have a Thursday night game against the Bengals and then see the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so the Ravens get stronger with adding Deontay Johnson. Yeah. When you add another look, he's still a good separator in my opinion. And obviously uh, been stuck over there in Carolina in that situation, uh, Baltimore's got a lot of weapons, uh, not only uh, at, 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 at running back in Henry, but uh, a couple of really good productive tight ends over there, uh, some some decent receivers and all. So uh, for them to pick him up for next to nothing, yeah, how, how can you not do that? Uh, I'm surprised that there weren't maybe another team or two involved in that to give up something a little bit stronger than what what uh, what Baltimore did. Yeah, because it's what? Baltimore gave up a fifth and Carolina gave back a sixth for yeah. Deontay. When you figure where these teams are going to finish record wise, Baltimore, a good team, Carolina, probably with top five selection. The difference might be 15 picks, which is they gave him up for nothing. I know he's a free agent after this year, but still, it's all you could get for him. Uh, yeah, I mean, Johnson has you know had an up and down season and he's clearly showed his frustration in Carolina. But when they had competent quarterback play, when Andy Dalton was playing, he was putting up good numbers, and so you have obviously a more than competent quarterback in Lamar Jackson. Johnson will have to know he's not the one A in this offense. Right. He's a smaller role in a run heavy offense with other receivers and Zay Flowers, their tight ends, Andrews Likely, and it's pretty clear that when Johnson's not getting the football, he gets unhappy pretty quickly. Reporting was two weeks into this thing, he was already upset and, and not happy with Carolina, and, and gets Steve Ho. So. He'll have to understand his role, but winning cures all, et cetera, et cetera. And Pittsburgh will have to deal with him for sure. Yeah, he if he keeps his head screwed on and gets even moderate production here, that'll help his free agent value. And we'll have to see how the compensatory formula all works out, the value that they get. So they they might, you know, they might end up getting at least a little value in that compensatory wise after the season. But in the here and now, it certainly does not hurt that offense. And speaking of receiver trades, the deadline is Tuesday, November 5th, and so we'll have one more show until then. Mike Williams seems less likely to be traded now. The Jets getting that upset. Well, not the upset, they're the favorites, but the win last night over the Houston Texans. Alan Lazard is on IR with a chest injury, so he'll be out the next four weeks. And the Jets may say, "Let's we're three and six. We got a win. We're feeling okay going to the deadline. We're feeling better at least. Let's try to hold on to Williams and Try to make a run. So even Williams, who seemed to be the most sensible and maybe cheapest trade acquisition, may no longer be an option. Yeah, uh, especially with them. Had they had they had they lost that game you, uh, last night to the Texas, you even wonder might might they move uh, uh, Devonte Adams on down the road? You know, uh, potentially because uh, they they really needed that game mm-hmm. last night. The Jets did, and 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 they got it against the Texans there. Uh, <laughs> Same old names kind of still, I guess, floating out there outside of that. Uh, and, and look, the Rams just uh, sounds like Puka 
uh, dinged his knee a little bit. I don't think it's serious, but we'll have to see if that cost him uh, this game. But the Rams are kind of right back in the thick of things after they beat the Minnesota Vikings last week. It's hard to imagine they're going to dump uh, Cooper Cup at this point. Uh, moving forward, we talked about Slayton the other day. I think something to maybe watch is this uh, Giants-Washington uh, game because if the Giants move to – uh, if they lose to uh, 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 to Washington, they'd be what two and seven at that point. And, uh, they they might be who knows maybe they'd be willing to move Slayton at that point. Uh, who are a few other teams that you know? I, I the, the Raiders wide receiver. I know that's been uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jacoby J Myers. J J Jacoby Myers. That's been tossed about. Uh, who else? Uh, it's really light from there. It's like Taekwon Thornton or Kendrick Bourne from New England. Neither of those really move my needle too terribly much. Tony Pauline's, and, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, Cortland Sutton. I just don't know why Denver would yeah. trade Cortland Sutton. He's, he's under contract through next year. They're four and four. They didn't want to deal him for a third round pick in that IU proposal earlier this year. I don't know what would change in November that would make them sellers. Yeah, and you want to give your quarterback some stability, yeah. young quarterback. Right. There, at least he's playing you know, better. Yeah, at least through the rest of this year. And if he's on a contract at a you know a, uh, at a, a retainable price, which he is, I think next year, uh, do you want to go swapping out your whole receiver core for, for a second year quarterback at that time? At that time, who made progress with with one of your guys? It, it, I'm not gonna look. I've been surprised in the past. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it, it, it feels less likely for Sutton. Now, I suppose, if, I mean, they're fine. Even if they, I mean, they, and who do they have? They got Baltimore. So even if they lose mm -hmm. this week, they're still in the wild card picture, you know? Sure. Sure. Yeah. You got seven seeds. So they're not out of this thing. They're not going to be sellers. So I, I'd be pretty surprised if they ended up trading Sutton at this point. I, 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 honestly, Dave, I mean, if they could add a slate and that'd be great, but you know, with some improvement, from Van Jefferson, Calvin Austin making plays, the upgrade that Russell Wilson's, you know, benefiting this passing offense. You're putting up points with this group. Is it even worth trading for a receiver? I mean, I've been all for it for the longest time to get like a, a, a needle mover. You know, Ayuk, Adams, I wanted Hopkins. You know, if they brought in Cup for the right price, I would have been good with that. Slate, I'm good with. But if it's like Mike Williams or Tyquan Thornton, is it even worth it at this point? Is it just worth rolling with the group that you have? Yeah, you might as well roll with what you have because you're going to have an integration period on top of it. And if right. it's a, just a blow, you know, a non-meat, non-needle uh, mover anyway, how much, you know, what, what, what is the actual high side of that, you know? Yeah. So at this point, you just may stay status quo. And I mean, every, every trade rumor and every conversation we've had has always ended in the same result of nothing right. happened. Pittsburgh didn't get that guy. So Maybe it's time to recognize that that just may be the, the answer. I mean, who knows? We'll see. Deadline, Spurs action, all that kind of stuff. We'll see how week nine plays out when teams can really cement, okay, what are we going to do here? Buy, sell, evaluate our roster, injuries, et cetera. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, at this point, you just may, may dance with the people you brought. Yeah, I guess the thing the two teams really watch are the Raiders and the Giants this week. And the Raiders, uh, uh, who did the Raiders have this week? They have... Uh, it's a divisional? It's an AFC North team, isn't it? Is it the Bengals? Bengals, yeah. So they play the Bengals and then the Giants play the Commanders. So we'll, uh, if you're going to do anything, obviously it's going to happen Monday or Tuesday of next week. If I'm the Giants, I'm trading Slate, and I don't know why to hold on to him. I guess kind of like the Broncos comment, give Daniel Jones some talent outside of neighbors, but I don't know. Get some. He's a free agent. He's going to be gone after this year. I trade him. Right. You might as well get uh, immediate compensation for him instead of having to wait for compensatory value and all like that. And yeah, he, and plus they're going to make moves in free agency. They're not right. going to get anything for him. Right. He's going to want to get out of there after this week if they lose anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, I was going to ask you about team expectations. We'll, we'll table that for Monday because there probably won't be a ton new to talk about for the Monday show day, which we'll do. So, yeah, let's make our picks for week number nine. Dave, you DM me last night and took the Jets and you said, let me get the verbatim quote here. Jets, two and a half for me. They are winning tonight. And you were right, Dave. All the money was on Houston, but you, you smelled a rat and, and you're wanting to know to start the week. Yeah, I wasn't feeling too great about that about halftime, though. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I thought the Jets would come out looking a lot better than than, than what they did. And 
Uh, but they got the W. Uh, it's nice to be uh, have a 1-0 lead on you. You had the Texans uh, plus the 2.5. I had the Jets minus 2.5. So I'm up. Let's go. Denver Broncos at the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, kind of uh, uh, going to be interesting to watch. I, you know, Lamar Jackson, I think everybody expects him to play, but he's not practicing the last couple of days. Uh, even so, the Ravens are 8.5-point home favorites against the Broncos. What say you? I mean, the Ravens do have the I think, dead last passing offense in football and pretty bad in some categories. Bo Nix has gotten better with that Broncos defense. I will say Ravens win Broncos cover. I'll take the Ravens. I'll lay that eight and a half without issue there. The commanders at the Giants. Uh, commanders laying four on the road against the G-men. Yeah, I'll take Washington. I'll take Washington late of four points as well, too. The Dolphins on the road against the Bills. Uh, obviously, two is back. Uh, they looked a little bit better offensively last week, but the Bills are six-point home favorites to the Dolphins. And Miami still blew that lead and lost to the Cardinals on that game-winning field goal by Arizona. I will yeah, this one, tough one. I will take... I'll take the Dolphins to cover. I'll take the Dolphins plus the six points to cover. I think the Bills win this, but I think the Dolphins keep it close. Raiders on the road against the Bengals. Bengals laying seven points. Doesn't sound like they'll have T. Higgins again. Yeah, that certainly affected them, but they know they need this win. They'll probably have a better plan because Higgins got hurt so late in the week. I will take the Bengals. I will take the Bengals late to seven points as well, too. The Dallas Cowboys uh, on the road against the Falcons. The Falcons laying three at home against the Cowboys. Falcons have been a sneaky good team this year. I mean, that offense, when it hums, it hums. I'll take, uh, I'll take Atlanta. I'll take Dallas. Dallas is going to win this one outright. Falcons, uh, I think all their wins have come in division, haven't they? But uh, mm. uh, I, I think Dallas bounces back. I'll take Dallas plus the three points. Chargers on the road against... Uh, the Jameis Winston says, <laughs> uh, Chargers uh, favored by one and a half on the road against Cleveland. Yeah, Winston turned this offense around. Really felt like it was a Deshaun Watson problem overall. He's so flighty there with the interceptions. This is in LA? No, on the road in Cleveland. In Cleveland? Mm, this one's tough. I will take, I'll take the Chargers, but I'm, I'm wrestling with this one. I'll take the Chargers late a point and a half on the road against the Browns. Saints on the road against the Carolina Panthers. Saints, they're going to get Carr back this week, I think. Uh, Seven-point road favorites against uh, the Panthers. And that line reflects the Carr's expected to return. They would not have that line if it was Jake Hayner or Spencer Rattler in the lineup. Um, Bryce Young making the start. The Panthers have no receivers. The Saints have no, no corners, no secondary. It's a race to the bottom. Quarterback play wins out. Give me the Saints. I'll take the Saints for all the reasons you just mentioned. I'll lay the seven points. Patriots on the road against the Titans. The Titans are three and a half point home favorites against the Patriots. That's going to be Drake May's status. He's in concussion protocol. He's been limited. I think he's going to go, but obviously really depends. Uh, my pick on, on his health and status. Mason Rudolph. Is Rudolph starting for sure? I think he's starting for sure for Tennessee. I this think week. he is. I'll spend a little time thinking or caring about this one, I will take the Patriots. I'll take the Titans later three and a half. I think they're the, their defensive front versus that uh, uh, Patriots messed, messed up offense line will be the difference there. So I will lay the three and a half. Jaguars on the road against the Eagles. Eagles laying seven and a half at home against the Jags. Yeah, I think the Eagles are starting to find their groove. Give me Philadelphia. I'll take Philadelphia later seven and a half with you. The Bears on the road against the Cardinals. The Cardinals are one and a half point home favorites against the bears man don't overlook arizona i mean they're they're getting some stuff going in the run game connor murray harrison defense isn't terrible i'll take arizona i'll take arizona late a point and a half as well too the what should be a good game to uh detroit lions on the road against the packers the lions are two and a half point road favorites at lambeau field Jordan Love status a bit unknown right now with that groin injury he seems to avoid it something serious I will take Detroit. I'll take the Packers. I think the Packers can upset them. So I'll take the two and a half points there. Rams on the road against the Seahawks. Boy, both these teams need this win. Rams are one point road favorites against the Seahawks. Yeah, I'm trying to think which way I want to go on this one. I will. Is DK Metcalf going to play? I honestly don't know his status with the knee injury. I'll take Seattle. 
home home team wins. I'll take the Rams on the road to win and cover that one. Uh, Colts on the road against the Vikings. The Vikings lost their left tackle, traded for uh, Cam Robinson, right? What's yeah, that? Jacksonville, Cam Robinson. Uh, all, all that said, uh, Flacco back in the back in the fold here. Uh, Vikings laying five at home against the Colts. Ah oh, man, do you blitz Joe Flacco with the ball getting out of his hand quickly? I will say the Colts cover. Yeah, I want to go that way too. All right, I'll go that way too. Colts plus five. I'll take it. Uh, Buccaneers on the road against the Chiefs. The Chiefs are eight and a half point home favorites against the Buccaneers. Hmm. How many points did the Chiefs score last week? Am I misremembering their offense? Has it shown any? I, mean, I know Kelsey's gotten more involved at the ninth ranked scoring offense. They had 27 against the Raiders, but that was a pretty close game. It's a pretty big line. The Chiefs aren't blowing teams out. I will take the Bucks to cover. I will take the Chiefs to cover. I think they get it right this week there. So uh, I think that was, I think that's all of them, right? Uh, yeah, that's all of them for week nine in the NFL. Obviously, no Steelers game to pick this week. All right, Dave, let's get to a couple of reader emails and close out today's show. All right, let's see if I can sort it out real quick. I don't imagine we have many of them in here. We have, let's see. Nathan Casey, Cortland Sutton, trade viability. If Sutton is under contract next year for reasonable money, he is, and the Broncos would eat some money to move him. Why not give up a third and a fifth next year, possibly make an extension part of the talks? He says the wide receiver market has exploded. Everyone is drafting wide receivers early, which gives these value at other positions. Uh, the Steelers probably need a defensive lineman next year to groom. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Drafting a wide receiver early probably takes some years to pan out. Also bringing in a wide receiver with chemistry with the current, current quarterback seems like a no brainer. Taking all that into account, uh, doesn't even a six second rounder and a fourth for their third seem reasonable. I, I wouldn't go that high on, on any of that. I'd try to, and look, I don't even know the, the Broncos probably tired of paying salaries that go to the Steelers, uh, on mm -hmm. top of it there. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm thinking more if, if they, if if the Broncos aren't willing to eat any of that remaining money on 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 Sutton this year, uh, would you swap a fifth for a fourth? That's the whole deal—a fifth and a fourth. Yeah, you 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 give up a fourth, and they give you a fifth back plus Sutton. Yeah, and they don't need any any salary. Sure, I would right. do that. I just. Don't know. I mean, they turned they turned on a third from San Francisco at the start of the year. I just don't know what would change for them to to reduce that cost by, by yeah. that much. Yeah. Uh, would deadline. you give up his his terms of a third and a fifth for Sutton? And let's assume they eat some amount of salary. I don't know if I maybe I'd go a I don't know a third and a seventh or something. Yeah, I think the third's a little heavy. I think. Yeah. And, and can, how, can Pittsburgh? How do they? What kind of picks do they have? Because the whole Fields thing is a little tricky in terms of what they have and that conditional six-rounder that could become a fourth-rounder, even though it's looking like it's going to stay a six-rounder. But who knows? Russ gets hurt. They, they could jump back up to a fourth in the 50% conditional clause. Can they trade a fourth-round pick if they only have one fourth-round pick? Or like, how does all that stuff work? Uh, I mean, if one is out there, do they? I haven't even, even looked at yeah. Tankathon lately to... Same. I mean, do they have only one fourth round pick? If they have two, obviously it's more more workable. And same with the sixth rounder. You know, can you? Because I think there's some clause in terms of like you can't trade right. so, picks something that, that may be up for right. Uh, right. Full full order. Uh, what do they have in the fourth right now? Uh, the Steelers the have one. one in the fourth right now, so I don't think they can move that right now. Right, because it would have to go to Chicago if. Fields plays 50% of the snap. So that is maybe, all, I wonder if that's a trickier part of the whole getting deals done because they kind of have some, and they, how many six round picks do they have? They do have two fifths. Okay. How many uh, six rounders? They have, and I'm assuming Tankathon staying on top of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they have a sixth, Alex. Right now. Well, I, I guess the Chicago is being assumed that six round pick currently from the Fields deal is that. Right. Where it's okay. Right. So yeah, Ch Chicago owns that pick. Right. Right. And it could become a fourth if, if Fields meets that mark. So I wonder if there's a little bit of inflexibility there that's maybe hampering some of the trades that Pittsburgh could get done. But yeah, I I don't think they could trade away that fourth round pick, which may 
you know, make a deal for a court on Sutton, which I don't think is going to happen anyway. You know, a little, a little trickier to, to to pull off. All right. Uh, Todd Gensler wants to know, since we have a bye week, now would be a good time to discuss the offseason, he thinks. If he continues his upward trajectory, I foresee Russell Wilson getting signed. But at what price? With the downward trajectory of Broderick Jones, don't we make a strong play for Dan Moore Jr.? He continues to improve and be solid. Don't want to let a good tackle go. Finally, Najee is killing it and is the epitome of Steelers football. How do we let him walk? What does the cap and money say about this? He says, I'm not even going to discuss fields and, and just how solid a, a character he has and how nice it is to have him on a team. Todd, I look, I understand it is the bye week. And a lot of people want to talk about this, but there's so much is going to happen here in the, in the second half of the season that what we say right now, if we if we lay out certain things, people are going to come back and said, well, remember when you said this, you know, and then all the pieces on the chessboard have been moved around and all like that. It's, it's, it's just, it's so hard to look that far ahead right now, especially when you're talking about guys that aren't under contract, like Dan Moore, like Russell Wilson, like Najee Harris. Uh, so much is going to be determined in the second half of the season. Well, we, at least we addressed what we think might could happen or would have to happen if both Russell Wilson and Justin Fields came back. But I mean, yeah, d- should, should they make a strong play at Dan Moore if he keeps playing the way uh, he's playing? Well, yeah, I, I think you should. But also that guy that, you know, there's a, there's an offensive line tackle tax that comes along with that. Is he going to play well enough where you just put the franchise tag on him? I kind of doubt it. Uh, you know, there's just so many very, you know, how will, will Broderick Jones make, you know, improve the, the, these last half of the season. And as far as Najee goes, we've talked about that several times. Najee would be foolish not to test free agency at the very least right now. Let's assume though, that Wilson plays well enough to come back. Where does the salary start on him? I mean, I think it's 40 million per year as a, as a starting point, the floor. I mean, what is the positional value right now overall at the quarterback position? Your top, uh, yeah, I mean, you you got 60, 50, I mean, 40 million wouldn't even put you in the top 10. Yeah, the, the cheap, like the bare minimum cheapest starting quarterback contract is Geno Smith at 25 million per year. From there, in terms of, you know, another level up, Baker Mayfield got 33.3 million from the Bucks this, this past off season. Uh, the only other starting quarterbacks making under 40 million are Rodgers, Derek Carr, Mayfield and Smith. That's it. Everyone else is, is 40 million plus, and then numbers go up over time. The quarterback market's you know, gotten even bigger. Dak hitting 60 million this year. So I know it sounds like a lot, and it is, but welcome to the world of paying quarterbacks. And I think I think you know, if Wilson plays well, and certainly if he leads this team to at least a playoff victory, 40 million, 40 million is the the minimum, the starting point. That would be a bargain. Yeah. You know, if he if he plays well the rest of the season there, because uh, what Matthew Stafford's at forty, Josh Allen's at forty three million, Patrick Mahomes is, of course, he's adjusted his forty five million, Kirk Cousins is forty five, uh, Kyler Murray's at forty six one, Jalen Hurts is at fifty one. It feels like he might even have to hit fifty million if if Russell takes his team to the playoffs and wins a couple of playoff games. Yeah, I I. W- I think it'd be between 40 and 50 and, and yeah, Wilson is older, but you know, quarterbacks play a long time. And as you just mentioned, Kirk Cousins got 45 million coming off a uh, torn Achilles. Right. And so, you know, it's ages. Is, it's just that. And you want to pay for a starting quarterback. Welcome to the world of it. So yeah, I think we're, I think we're talking 40 million. If it's fields, maybe we're getting closer to the 30 million, 30, you know, around the Baker type of deal. We might, my, my, my guess on that one. All right, uh, hit a couple of questions there. We run a little bit long on this uh, Friday here. Uh, I suppose we should start wrapping it up here, Alex. So any other final thoughts? I'll get us out of here. No, come back on Monday. We'll have a live stream Monday since we didn't do it this past week because of obviously the Giants game. So enjoy the weekend off. Enjoy the stress-freeness. And uh, yeah. Talk to you guys Monday. All right. Uh, follow me on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate, SteedersDepot.com, hit the donate button. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad free button. Upright navigational bar. Follow the directions that way. Get yourself a login. And you'll have an ad free version of the site. So until Monday, everybody enjoy your weekend. And as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.